And this man played 14 years in the NBA, 11 with the Lakers. He scored over 15,000 points during his career while winning three NBA titles. He also coached four NBA teams, including the Lakers. Ladies and gentlemen, Byron Scott on my radio show. Hey, Byron, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Rick. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks again for joining us. And I hope you don't mind if we start with the difficult stuff first. Um, you know, a lot of us, I think, as we go into the future, are always going to remember where we were when we heard the news on January 26, 2020, that Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and seven others died in that traffic helicopter crash. How did you hear the news? Uh, Rick, I was at home uh, sitting on the bed watching the Farmers Insurance Golf Tournament just trying to get a glimpse of Tiger and uh, my wife come running in. Uh, we were getting ready. For, well, I was ready. She was getting ready for church, and she come running in screaming uh, that Kobe had died in a helicopter uh, accident. And I said, no, no. Yeah, I didn't believe that. And I started surfing the channels, uh, and, and obviously my phone started ringing. I uh, started getting a lot of messages because I wasn't answering the phone. And, you know, about an hour later or so, uh, it was confirmed that he had, you know, uh, died in the uh, helicopter accident along with Gigi and seven other uh, people. And I was, I was just shocked. I was in disbelief. I was hurt. I was uh, angry. Um, you know, and it, it, it just it tried to go to church anyway, and didn't got to church and turned around and went home. Um, you know, I, I was just really just, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I just really couldn't believe it. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is that you had the rare opportunity to both play on the same Lakers team as Kobe in, in 1996, his rookie year, and then you got to coach him from 2014 to 2016, which included his final season. Let's start with Kobe, the teammate. What was he like? He was great. He was just a young kid that was trying to find his way, that was happy to be in the NBA and, you know, fell out, fulfill a dream that he had. And... Um, very inquisitive, uh, ask a ton of questions. We sit on the bench together. We would sit uh, on the bus and talk um, after practice. We, I mean, we, we just talked all the time. I mean, he really wanted to find out uh, much as much about the game as possible. And, um, you know, we really enjoyed his rookie year. It was my last year with the Lakers, uh, and it was his first year along with Shaq. And so we had a really good time of just getting to know each other, and I watched the kid just grow and grow every single day. And I knew, you know, being around him in practice every day uh, when he was 18 years old, I knew he was going to be a great player. You know, I, I just knew it. I, I just I saw the work ethic. I saw his determination, um, you know, and, and, and I saw it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I knew he was going to be great. Former Laker Byron Scott on my radio show. Uh, my relationship with Kobe Byron, Byron was strictly professional. I, I would have to go out and interview him. I had to do it in good times. I had to do it in bad times. So we had a, a reporter-athlete uh, relationship. But my my favorite uh, experience with Kobe was uh, my very first interview with him, and it was that rookie year that you're talking about. I remember it because we were doing uh, the late-night newscast, and uh, and I remember the, the PR guy said, hey, we're going to bring Kobe over. And... Uh, I looked at this kid. I thought, you know, he just he just left the high school cafeteria in Lower Marion, Pennsylvania, and part of my interview, right. part of my interview, I said to him, "And now you're riding Jerry Buss's limo to the game, <laughs> and he's dating celebrities." And when I when I looked at him, he was the definition of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. He wasn't the the assassin, the killer that that you remember later in his career. He was there was an innocence about him. Did you sense that as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, when I met him, he was 17, you know, uh, and, and I had the fortune of meeting him before we got on the basketball court because I met him at, uh, in Orlando when, we, when the NBA used to do the uh, rookie transitional period, and Kobe was there, and I was there as well, and so I got a chance to meet him there. And, yeah, very innocent, very humble, uh, just a great kid. You could tell he was, he was brought up right. I mean, he addressed me every day as Mr. Scott. And which was crazy to me, you know. But uh, yeah, he, he was definitely that kid that w once he got to LA and you know got on the court and, uh, and started playing basketball, you know, he was still a kid, you know. And like like I said, he was trying to find his way in this crazy town and this uh, crazy league, and uh, he he was going through it every single day. But the the, the great thing about him is that 
you know, he had a vision of where he wanted to be. And, um, you know, you could see that in him every day as well. He was a kid, but he also, you know, knew what he wanted to do. Let's talk about the Kobe in his prime. I, I always felt that uh, the Kobe would have been a great golfer or a great tennis player and individual sport athlete. He, he seemed compelled to always take things into his own hands and even at the expense of his teammates sometimes. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, he was definitely, he would have definitely been a great, you know, golfer, tennis, whatever the case may be. I, I don't think there's a sport that he wouldn't have played and wouldn't have been great at it because of uh, uh, the, way it went, the way he went about it. Um, you know, he, he made a statement a while back, you know, obviously way back long ago when a reporter asked him, you know, do you trust your teammates? And he said, of course I trust them, but I trust me more. <laughs> you know, and that was just his attitude. Yeah. You know, I mean, he was a guy that if you wasn't getting it done, I'll do it myself type attitude. And uh, for the most part, he was able to do that, you know. But you know, obviously it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way because they, they – misunderstood him as a, as a player. They, you know, they, they took that for being a ball hog and selfish where really it's all about he just wanted to win, and he wanted to win so bad that he would do whatever it took to win. I always wondered what it was like for Pat Riley coaching Magic Johnson. Magic was sort of a, a coach on the court, and then you had a chance to coach Kobe. I, is there much coaching to do when it comes to a superstar? Not really. You know, I mean, Kobe at that time had seen and done everything that you could possibly do on a basketball court. Uh, really, it's not coaching, it's more managing. And, and that's what I really consider myself at that particular stage of his career is just, you know, managing his time, uh, managing his uh, his minutes, managing his practice, uh, practice hours and things of that nature. Because, again, those two years, the one thing that I wanted to do, Rick, is make sure he got to game number 82 of, of 2016. I wanted him to go out uh, the same way he came in, you know, playing the game that he loved. I didn't want him to be all banged up, you know, so I was really just trying to manage, you know, everything about him from a basketball standpoint to make sure that when game 82 came around in that season, his last season, that he would be relatively healthy enough to go out there and perform the way he's capable of performing. Former Laker Byron Scott on my radio show. Um, Byron, I think he would have uh, continued to carve out a very successful life in retirement with his, his business and his philanthropic endeavors. He seemed really business savvy to me. What do you think? Oh, he was. Yeah, he was. I mean, he would, you know, text me at 3, 4 in the morning to find out what we were doing in practice, and I would get up at 6, 6.30, and I would call him and, you know, say, I got your text. You know, what's going on? He said, I'm just calling the coach to see what we're going to do today. And I was, <laughs> I say, well, don't you think you might want to call me at an hour where I might be up, you know, <laughs> instead of, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning? And I said, do you sleep? He said, no, nah, I really don't because I'm, I'm really focused on life after basketball and getting this company up and running when I'm done. And so he, he had already, you know, started preparing um, for his, le- his second life. He started preparing for not only the business aspect of it, but, but as we know, you know, with, with their basketball and some of the other things that he was writing for children, uh, he was preparing for also, you know, the fatherhood and the, and, and the husband aspect of it, you know, where you're going to be home a lot more and be able to be involved in your family and kids' lives. So uh, he was preparing for that, I, I think, before I even, you know, started coaching because the times, the two years that I was there, we talked about uh, life after basketball, some of the things that he was, uh, you know, involved in. And, he, he took that just like he took basketball very seriously, and he was going to dive into it 110% and give it everything he got. So I knew he would have been extremely successful uh, in the business world as well. Former Laker Byron Scott on my radio show. All right, By- Byron, let's uh, change gears a little bit. The, the NBA trade deadline uh, just passed yesterday. The Clippers added Marcus Morris and Isaiah, Isaiah Thomas, who it's expected they're going to waive. The Lakers were quiet. Are you concerned? No, not really, Rick. You know, I, I said this about three weeks ago on 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 Fox, uh, the Fox show uh, with uh, Undisputed. You know, with my, with my guy Skip and and, and uh, Shannon. Uh, you know, I, I think they're they're set. I think they have a great great basketball team. I think a lot of it's going to fall on AD. You know, whether that's good or bad, I think he's the type of guy that can carry you to a championship. Uh, and it's going to be a lot put on his shoulders. But, you know, I, I said I thought they needed one more piece. I thought they needed a backup, you know, point guard, somebody that can alleviate LeBron of having to, you know, bring it up and initiate the offense and get everybody involved and do all those things. And I thought then 
that Darren Collison would be a great fit. You know, he's a guy that plays both ends of the floor. He doesn't turn the ball over. He runs the team extremely well. He can make shots. Uh, he, def- he defends. Uh, you know, so I-, I mentioned that about three weeks ago. Now I hear everybody talking about Darren Collison <laughs> right now. So, yeah. you know, I-, I thought it was a good fit. Like, it doesn't cost him draft picks, you know, or, or anything like that. Uh, you know, he's basically an unrestricted free agent. He can play wherever he wants. And I still think it would be a good fit. So if, if Darren, you know, came on board, I think it really enhances their chances. You're not saying he's a savior, but he is a definitely good piece to add to any team. Well, he was sitting next to Jeannie Buss, I guess, at uh, at the arena last night in that Houston game, watching the, the game there. Uh, all right, Lakers, yeah. Lakers currently have the, the second-best record in the NBA. Milwaukee is ahead of them. The Clippers right behind. As we close in on the All-Star break, who's the best? Well, I mean, if you look at – Look at the way all three of those teams are playing. Milwaukee's the best team in basketball right now, uh, and and they probably got the best player. You know, uh, you know the freak, the Greek freak is playing unbelievable. After coming off of having a um, MVP season, he's even playing better. His outside shot has gotten better, and I think we all agreed. You know, last year when we talked about Giannis, is that if he gets a shot where he can rely on from 17, 18 feet on a night-to-night basis, you will not be able to guard this kid. Well, he's, he's not only done that, he's, he's stretched it out to the three-point line as well. So you look at the Milwaukee Bucks and, and their, their, their makeup and the way they play on both ends of the floor. Uh, right now, you know, if you're looking at these teams before this you know, all-star break happens, they are the best team in basketball. But uh, just like any, anything, when you get to the playoffs, everything slows down. You don't get out on the break as often. Uh, every team has scouted you now, and they're going to take away that first – second option and make you go to their third option so we'll see if they're going to be able to adjust better than they did last year in the playoffs but Giannis right now is playing unbelievable basketball so the Milwaukee Bucks are the best team I think in basketball right now all right last two questions for you I was told to ask you who's the best golfer from Inglewood you or Reggie Theus oh without a doubt Byron Scott (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, Reggie, Reggie, Reggie's my guy, you know, and that's my guy. I saw him on the dri- on the driving range the other day. I had my granddaughters; they take lessons, so I wouldn't say hello to him. But uh, yeah, Reggie, Reggie hits it a little bit longer than me, but my short game and putting is much better, and that's what I think separates. <laughs> right, put, uh, right, drive for show is that what they say? Putt for dough. Drive for show, putt for dough. Putt for dough. Right. <laughs> All right, listen. The, the final the final thing is, you did you play around the golf with my buddy uh, George Lopez the other day? I did. Yeah, tell that knucklehead to, to return one of my uh, my texts or emails one of these days, would you? <laughs> I used to run you around. With I will. George, I, I, and, and yeah, listen, George and I are playing next week as well. Oh, are you? You know, yeah. You know, it was great that George had called me and he said, you know, B, I know you're hurting, man, but let's get out and play uh, around the golf. I think we both need it, and, and he was right. You know, so I went out and joined him and a couple of friends of his. And it was the longest round of golf that I've ever had in my life. Really? And we didn't, we didn't keep score because we stopped after like seven or eight holes at the little, you know, little snack bar. And we had margaritas and cigars and we just talked <laughs> and we let groups, groups pass us. And then we went and we would go another seven or eight holes and we passed that same bar area. We stopped again. I mean, it was the best round, the most fun I've had in a long time on the golf course. And George was George was George, Rick. You know him. He's going to have jokes for you. We had an unbelievable time, and I left there, and I, I, I texted him, you know, on my way home, and I said, man, thank you so much, man. I love you, brother, and, and, and I really needed that. And he said, look, let's do it again. I said, okay, so we're going to play again next week and have some more fun. And, it's, uh, it, it, you know, I think both our hearts won't be so heavy this time. Oh, that's great. And you're right. It, it can be great therapy sometimes, right? Yes, it can. Yeah, until you muff up that little chip shot that's only 20 yards away. Right? <laughs> <laughs> then, you remember, yeah, then you remember what golf is all about. <laughs> Ladies and yeah, gentlemen, true, true. <laughs> Byron Scott on my radio show. Listen, we appreciate every time you give us the time. It, it, means, it means a lot to us. So, Byron Scott, thanks for hanging out with us. Rick, anytime, my man. All Thank right. you for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. We love a friend of the show, Byron Scott, there.